I'm Aaron Zimola, and you are watching Marketing Tip Tea Time, where we serve up stories, tips, and sips for you to enjoy at home. Today, we actually have a very special guest who sent us his own tea from his company, and we're really excited. As, as, as you can see here, I was reading through the little pamphlet as the show started. Uh, this is the founder of Tico, which is Pete Jokish. Now, let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a former professional athlete. So, you know, I'm super excited to dive in with him about what that was like being a professional athlete and how the tea came about. As many of our viewers know, I did run in high school and college. Uh, I ran cross country and track. And so I am always, always very interested in learning about athlete entrepreneurs. So he's a former professional athlete who turned entrepreneur. And Pete Jokish created Tico out of necessity to improve his overall health and well-being. So I'm like, you know, super interested. Growing from a farmer's market darling to a local food service staple and now a regionally distributed ready-to-drink sparkling tea. Pete has experienced every aspect of the entrepreneurial journey. Please help me in welcoming Pete Jokish. Here he is. <laughs> thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, no problem, no problem. You know, first I really want to highlight the tea. Be as you can see on the table in the studio, beautiful branding. It really, it really stands out. And um, I, you know, I'm gonna read a little bit. This is their pamphlet. Like I said, it came with a beautiful box that uh, Pete had sent to our studio here in Greeley. Tico refreshment down to a T. Oh man, so so good. The copywriting is amazing. Hailing from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, Tico makes better for you beverages more approachable for people to live a more natural lifestyle. We're proud to be founder made brewing all-star organic ingredients that go big on flavor. We keep it simple, refreshing, and functional with just the right amount of fizz. We're for celebrating the big wins and the little ones. We're for making things the old school natural way for those with a natural inclination to play. We are natural champions. And they're certified organic, no added sugar, low calories, natural caffeine. Uh, wow, yeah. This looks you awesome. touched on all of them. <laughs> Great intro there. I know the the this this is is fantastic. So you know I I want to uh, try one of these teas here, and I think I'm going to try the orange ginger punch. Let's see if we can. This is a really fancy microphone, so let's see if we can get the. Ooh. Hopefully that sounded better, better viewers. Yeah, that sounded really good. <laughs> And then uh, tea cam, Josh, and we can sort of pour. We haven't had a fizzy tea that we've poured yet, so let's let's go ahead and try this. Yes, yeah, so this one's going to be a, a fun color, definitely that reddish uh, ruby hue, if you will. Uh, should be a really beautiful color, wow. and those effervescent bubbles should add a really interesting dynamic as well. That that is beautiful. Wow. Let me uh, and I'm I'm going to go ahead and taste this. That's right. We don't have to steep. Usually we have to steep a tea. Look at how red that is. The color is amazing. Yeah, it comes from the uh, organic hibiscus that we use in that. That's really going to give it that subtle tartness. Uh, that one in particular is our orange ginger punch. It's the, uh, as you can tell, we have a very uh, kind of retro mm. vibe to us. And so uh, yeah. this one's the new kid, new kid on the block, if you will, tapping into that nostalgia. So I'm uh, really excited wow. about this flavor. That is really good. You know, uh, I've got to admit, not all the time am I the biggest fan of ginger. But this, the ginger is subtle enough on the front end and you kind of get it on the back end a little more that it's not a slap you in the face ginger. The hibiscus actually comes out a little bit more to me as a front flavor, which is really interesting. Yeah. I thought that the most ginger teas, like the ginger comes out like a boxer and is punching you in the face. Yeah. And this one's this one's really nice, and it's fizzy, and that's yeah, that's yeah, the, that's uh, a real treat. The fun part mm -hmm. of product development is trying to tell a story not only through your packaging, through the marketing, but also through the actual tasting experience. So people, when they yeah. try it, they, they want to learn more, and they try to pick up on the different flavor nuances, and uh, that's the, the fun part for us, but also the challenge of making it approachable. So. Oh man, it is the. Yeah, that's a fantastic tea. I'm, 
I, I think King Super sell this, sells these. Um, I yeah, we're uh, here locally. Local King Super, so. King Supers, uh, Sprouts, Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, number of other smaller specialty retailers. So, yeah. Wow. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Okay, so now that we've uh, tasted the tea, and today's show is kind of going to be all about the tea and about Pete as well, but a lot about the tea, we're going to dive into the questions. And so the, this first round of questions are just rapid fire, this or that, your favorite something. You don't have to really explain yourself, um, and we can just dive on in. All right. Are you ready, Pete? Let's do it. All right. Your favorite flavor of Tico tea? Pineapple mate. Ooh. Did I get that one in my pack? I don't think we uh, that was oh. included. I have it right here, actually. <laughs> I'll have to, oh, that's a beautiful. Yeah, that's the yellow yellow packaging. Yeah, I don't have that one. I'll have to go buy you it. Get on purpose um, so, then you, so then you have to get it next time. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what's your favorite marketing book? Blue Fishing by Steve Sims. Blue Fishing. We're gonna Josh write that down. We have to go find that later. Uh, digital or print media? Print. Oh, oh. well, I mean, you know, super. I'm just an old school, old school guy, and I just from handwriting stuff down to like touch, feel like I don't know the the, the physical type stuff. Uh, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I like to have it in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. What's the most unique thing about your teas? The approachability of the product. And I can elaborate yeah. on that. It's uh, how do you take stuff that's inherently healthy, add a level of nostalgia to it, try and deliver something on the marketing side that like catches their attention, but also then delivers on the product. So it's to me, approachability is such a huge part of consumer product goods, uh, but also creating something unique. So yeah. the, uh, my favorite part. That's a, that's great. That's great. No, I, I know because a lot of times something really healthy, organic, natural, it, the packaging looks scary. It looks like you have to like live in the woods and, you know, do, do everything yourself in order for you to buy it. And, and this just looks like this is for the everyday person. Yeah, absolutely. It's the adage that uh, anything that tastes great probably isn't good for you, or if it's good for you, it doesn't taste great. So for us, it's trying yep. to crack that code, and that's the fun part, no doubt. Right, right. Now, you know, in, a, in your bio, uh, you mentioned lacrosse. Like, you, you were, you were, your story is rooted in sports. And I, I want to kind of touch on two things. The first thing is, what lessons did you learn in sports that transferred to entrepreneurship. And then the second thing I want to know is how did this tea company come out of a necessity for what you needed in sports? So it's kind of a, a little bit of a twofer there. Yeah, absolutely. So I can obviously start on the, on the first part of that, the lessons that you learn. Um, I do think that there is um, a level of competitiveness that exists in both obviously sports and then on the, the entrepreneurial journey, just business in general. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of parallels between the two, but there's also a lot of things that are kind of a lot of dots that are hard to connect. And so for me, some of the lessons, there's three lessons that I really kind of pull from uh, that I think are like most glaring, at least in my personal experience and my journey is first thing is you got to love doing it. Like going to the sports side of things, you have got to love putting in the work because if you want to do well at it, it's, it's going to be difficult, right? You got to put in the work. Uh, and it's the same thing with starting your own business. Uh, the entrepreneurial journey is you're going to have ups and downs. It's going to be challenging. You had better really love what you're doing um, because it's going to test you. Um, it's going to challenge uh, your perseverance, your courage, um, fortitude, all those types of things, all those fun buzzwords. So you got to love doing it. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that you have to kind of have this mentality that like hard work doesn't always pay off. And, and what I mean by that mm. is it's, it always doesn't work out and that's okay. Right? Like sometimes you're going to, you work hard and, and play a game and you're going to lose. 
Uh, you did everything you right. can. It's just the ball didn't bounce your way, right? And same thing in, in business is you can still put in the hard work and it may not work out um, to how you anticipated. But that's okay. Like those are learning experiences. It's not a it's not a global failure. It's a loss, but it's not a failure. And so that's kind of the second thing is that that hard work doesn't always uh, pay off and that you got to kind of wow. power through some of those moments really learn from them. We, we um, call that spilling the, the tea last... here on Marketing Tip Tea Time. <laughs> so that was that's a great bit of advice for anybody who wants to go and really do anything, I think. You know, there, there's always that aspect that there's a chance yeah, well, that things just aren't going to work out. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of society leads you to believe that if you just do the work, it's going to work out. Or if, you, or if you pursue your passion, it's going to work out. And that's not always the case. And so being real with what the possibilities are, uh, obviously you have all intention of it working out or else you wouldn't be doing it. But you come into grips with the fact that it may not is a, a part of that growth. So, um, But then the third thing is that the, the thing about sports and the thing about um, entrepreneurship is that in sports, it's it's a little bit easier to align your goals right? There's a season. Mm. Typically there's a championship involved. There's games. So there's like these mile markers along the way to kind of test uh, your discipline. Are you practicing the right way? You know, you can benchmark it in a game, a result, compile those games together, compete for a championship. Everyone has the goal of winning in the championship. In business, everyone has a different meaning of what a championship is for their professional career and so mm. trying to align the entire team around you know this championship is really difficult because the meaning and the version of championship to me as a founder may be different than the person we hire on to do sales or the person that does production and so tapping into understanding why they're at the company and, and what they're trying to contribute to uh that's like the art a little bit and i think that very early on i did not understand that i just thought that if you just show mm -hmm. up yeah. and put in the work everyone else will kind of follow suit and everyone should know what the championship is but it's um it's not always that way so that's where the the lessons you learn from sports and in lacrosse specifically is it's very easy to align on what the goal is in sports um it's a little bit more challenging in the professional world and so uh learning to kind of hone that craft a little bit has been uh a challenge over the years and continues to be, to be honest with you. Right. Right. And I know that you sort of had the idea about Tico coming out of a necessity from the sports world. Can you explain sort of what you were thinking, what you were looking for as an athlete that you put into Tico? Yeah. So, and this is where we saw a massive opportunity is when you, are dedicating, your, dedicating yourself to a sport or just being active in general, whatever that um, the goal may be, right, for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you have things that you consume for performance, whether it be like a pre-workout or a protein afterwards or whatever it may be. You have supplements and things of that nature. But it's all the in-between moments. And you actually spend a lot more time not training than you do training. And so there's all these in-between moments right. that you really need to focus on your well-being and staying healthy. Uh, but you also want to indulge. You want to enjoy the products you're consuming, have them taste good, but also be good for you. And so that's where really tea fit in for me. It's um, I saw it as it's an inherently healthy beverage. Now, there's a number of companies that have made it unhealthy, but historically speaking, tea is an inherently healthy beverage. And so how do you make right. it to where it's enjoyable, sessionable, whatever term you want to use? Um, to bake it into your everyday lifestyle. So uh, I, I know firsthand the benefits of tea, uh, and I wanted to make it a little bit more approachable for people to incorporate throughout their day and throughout their lifestyle without having to sacrifice either really great flavor or just really great benefits. Right, right. And I noticed that in, in some of the uh, copy on your website and things like that, you sort of said, you know, for me, tea was great, but an aspect that was missing was the flavor. And you sort of wanted Tico to be a leader in tea flavor as well, so that people enjoyed the drink and what, you know weren't just downing, like you said, all these other healthy things that they're like, all right, I got to drink this because I've got to drink it, <laughs> but to actually enjoy that experience. Yeah, it's a we've been referred to as like a gateway tea, <laughs> where people Ooh, said, "Well, I drink tea." Gateway. Yeah, tea. they have been. I drink tea when I don't feel good, 
uh, it makes me feel better. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't you drink it all the time then? (laughs) And so, um, you know, we just saw an opportunity to say, okay, well, let's, there's an opportunity to make it a little bit more approachable. And we drew a ton of inspiration from the craft beer industry, uh, to where they took, you know, a, a relatively stale, uh, environment and a product at that time and, and really flipped it on its head, utilizing herbs, spices, fruits, things yeah. of that nature and made it more appealing. And so we definitely yeah. adopt a very craft brewery mentality with our own tea brewing facility uh, up in Longmont. Wow. Wow. And that's, you know, that's not too far from our, uh, from our studio, actually, you know, we're up in Greeley. So, you know, Longmont for anybody who's watching and doesn't know about Colorado, Longmont is just sort of down the road from us. I can get there and 25 minutes on a good day. Um, so, yep. all right. And, you know, with these, with these parallels with the beer industry, you know, the, the alcohol industry is also very good at branding and you obviously are also super awesome at branding. I mean, this is all very impressive. And Oh, by the way, everyone, we also got these stickers in case you were wondering. And so, you know, my question is how did you come up with this brand? How did you land on the brand? What was that process like? Yeah, it's been quite the journey um, from consuming whole leaf teas, uh, myself, again, kind of focusing on the healthy attributes to really gravitating more towards, you know, uh, iced tea beverages, a little bit more sessionable for me, I definitely operate um, uh, better on on the cold beverage side of things. And so iced tea is definitely uh, more in my vein. And then how do you make it a little bit more approachable uh, with this fizz factor? And so um, you know, from a brand perspective, you mentioned earlier that it starts at a necessity, at least it did for me. Uh, and that's really what it's about. Um, I really enjoyed tea. I got into it. Uh, guys on the team, uh, you know, would drink it and say, man, this actually does taste pretty good. And, uh, yeah, there was a little caffeine nice. book in that, in that yerba mate or that black tea. And, and so when you start down this path, you know, I will say, um, we didn't quite have direction early on. We just said, we have a product and... I think people like it. So let's go sell it. So we went to farmer's markets um, and you kind of alluded to in the intro, you know, this farmer's market darling. So we, you know, went, made our rounds for a, a number of summers, just doing all the farmer's markets, selling, uh, you know, glasses of iced tea, whole leaf tea blends, um, not really having an identity at that time. Obviously the, the Tico name um, we, we discussed prior to, uh, to the episode here about the name Tico and it actually originates from the word Pico And Pico is utilized in the grading system of tea. Uh, And so when I first got into tea and wanted to kind of start this endeavor, uh, we're big into family heirlooms in my family. And my grandma gave me uh, an old family tea tin. And it was a grandmother's tea, coincidentally. And it was an orange Pico tea. And I kind of had this like, you know, it was fiddling with different names and things of that nature. And at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday in the morning, I uh, had this little tea tin on my table. And I... I kind of just was like, man, Pico, kind of, you know, Tico, kind of, you know, play on words. And if you're in the industry, industry, you know it. But if you're not, it's a, it's a unique spelling. So I did a trademark search uh, at like, you know, two thirty in the morning and found out that Pyrex Glass <laughs> Company actually had a Tico teapot that they produced in the uh, '60s and '70s, um, and they just uh, allowed the trademark to run out and expire, and it actually expired on the exact day and year I was born. And I thought wow. that's got to be a sign. So um, <laughs> that's how the, the name was born. Uh, and that's uh, how we got into the tea industry with uh, the name Tico. And as I mentioned, it's kind of evolved over the years, but we've settled on this fizzy tea product is something that we think is really unique and yeah. different. Uh, it has a ton of potential, um, not only to grow regionally, but net, but nationally. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, um, how, I guess a follow-up question is how, did you also land on the aesthetic, you know, the, the retro, the, the sort of matte colors, um, pastel mats? What, how did you land on that specifically too? Yeah. So the, coincidentally, the, the timing of this uh, episode is really great because uh, we just introduced our new branding uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, Congratulations. About in, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um I mentioned earlier it was a, a, been quite the journey. Uh, I, I would say that over the years we've had kind of a, a lost identity in some capacity. Um, I think as a brand, you're always influenced by what's trendy, right? New font packages yeah. that come out, new design styles, 
what's hot. You always see these things um, come through about what's next, right? And you get caught up when you don't tap into your identity. You get caught up into chasing. Um, and I think right. in marketing, when you're chasing, you're always going to be behind. And that's in any aspect of life. So um, we, on this new aesthetic, we took a lot of time. Um, it, again, it was about an 18 month process. We, for the first time, engaged an outside agency to really kind of help us better understand and articulate the reason why we exist, why I started the brand and what we're trying to ultimately position, how we're trying to position ourselves to consumers. So part of that process, and I think this is a, you know, just a good overall tip from a marketing perspective is we had an idea that we, that we needed to kind of change and become a little bit better version of ourselves and tap into some of our roots. But let's not be quick about it. Let's make sure that we write this idea down and let's revisit it in a month and make sure that we're aligned on it. And let's make some progress, but let's not try and see this all the way through. Let's revisit another three months after that. And let's make sure that we are down this path for the right reason, that we're not following any trends, and that we yeah. are excited about the direction of this rebrand six months from now that we are today. Um, and I would say right. in years past, we'd be saying, oh, this new font package, it's got to get it out there um, and, and look trendy and hip. And it just wasn't our identity, to be honest with you. So um, we needed right. that 18 months to tap into our roots. And I think that, you know, we, we definitely say we're a recreational vibe. Uh, we tap into yeah. the old school aesthetics and that kind of nostalgia. Um, oh yeah. That we this reminds me of when I was, when I was little and my parents were huge runners, uh, back in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands. And this reminds me of the kind of, uh, colors and iconography that I'd see at these races. Um, yeah. it was super retro. Everybody had the hats that were sort of uh, almost this exact color here. <laughs> so part of this process was, was fun was we definitely embodied this kind of late seventies, early eighties recreational aesthetic, uh, from a color palette. We looked at this and said, you know, we're not, all of our products are distinctly different in formulation. So we're not like, you know, they're not all the same base formula, which is with a rotating flavor. They're all distinctly different. So they're actually their own little team. And so we don't call them labels. We call them uniforms. And each one of these products has its own uniform. And so we tapped into old oh, school wow. uh, color palettes of like sports teams really across the board um, to draw inspiration yeah. for each one of these and to be their own character. Yeah, that's, that is really clever, actually, the way that you've you've taken that and these are uniforms. I really like that way of thinking about it because I, you know, there are other brands that have multiple sorts of uh, products as well that are all, let's say tea or they're all whatever. Um, but they brand them so different. Sometimes you can't, you don't notice that they're the same company or they're also uniform that you don't understand that they're different products. So I think that this has been, yeah, a really fantastic way of uh, of doing that. That is clever. Oh man, <laughs> I yeah, like that. A, really that study about nostalgia, right? Where, and I'll keep the the sports references going. Like, you always remember your personal self. Like, oh, that game in high school, I killed it, you know. And I had, you know, yeah. or you know, I ran amazing. Your parents would be like, you weren't that great. Like, it wasn't a great time, <laughs> or you didn't really. Start <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. It better than it was. Yep. The same thing with like athletes, yep. your favorite athletes. I only buy like vintage jerseys of like Bo Jackson Royals jersey because everyone remembers him <laughs> as like this amazing player. I don't buy any more current players, so we wanted to tap into this yep. and, and have that same sort of like you know connection with people and kind of that taking you back in time a little bit to when times right. were better. <laughs> At least you think. Yeah. 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 We always look back on time and think, wow, that was better then. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. And you know what, with that growth sort of mindset of, of, you know, sometimes looking back and thinking, Oh, things were better then, or realizing things are better now, you know, you started so small at, at different, you know, like you said, you were the darling of, uh, the different farmers markets throughout Colorado. And now you're a much larger distributed tea brand. Can you tell me what some of the big like marketing moments were? on that journey where you had sort of a breakthrough because I don't know about, about you, but for other brands I've seen, and even for us, we've seen where there's sort of these like 
and even in performance in sports, you feel like you've plateaued and then suddenly, boom, you, you get the PR or you get the, the wins that you, you thought you weren't going to get. And then you sort of, you know, it's a, it's a function like that. Can you tell me of some of those moments in your uh, T career with Tico? Yeah. Um, it, again, it's been quite the journey uh, over the years. Uh, as we've kind of our business model has changed. And so, you know, the word marketing can wear so many different hats. And so um, a big thing for us is is finding, you know, the right positioning. That is definitely, mm. um, you know, one of those kind of inflection points for us. Um, we've been in the T space, so we know T really well from not only the nuances of the leaves and things like that, but also the seasonality and, and, and regionality of T. And so we noticed that T in the Rocky Mountain Territory um, iced tea would just fall off a cliff, you know, come October, November, and it'd pick back up right around baseball started kind of into March, uh, early April. Uh, and then obviously hot tea would kind of like replace that during those winter months, but then it would fall off. Um, and it was just really challenging to kind of build a predictable model there. Um, the seasonality was just very difficult. Um, and so for us, we, we knew that the ready to drink space could provide a little bit more stability. So for us, I think that big marketing moment, if you will, was just the ideation of how do we take tea, which whether it's hot or iced has seasonality, how do we put it in a format? Let's play off the popularity of sparkling beverages, bring over the healthy inherent attributes um, of tea and try to make it a more year round beverage. And so that was like a really big wow. moment for us of like identifying that this could be a product for us specifically that could have more year round relevance and not have the peaks and valleys quite that, you know, fresh brewed or like whole leaf tea would have. So that was like the first kind of big marketing wow. moment. Um, and then I think just most recently, um, the, the transition to this packaging was, was a big moment for us. Yeah. Um, he's tr tapping into my personal story making sure that it's authentic to who we are as a brand um, and that those are parallel with one another. Um, and that it's also something that we feel like has longevity and it's not just going to be the next trend in regards to yeah. uh, packaging and things of that nature. So we want to kind of cut through some of that noise. So I think those are the first things is the, the pivot from traditional tea to fizzy and then the refinement and repositioning of the fizzy tea um, that just more represents who we are. Wow. No, that's fantastic. And, you know, do you have a lot of, as, a, as another sort of question that's off script here, do you have a lot of athletes who are drinking this tea at the moment? You know, we've actually had quite a few people that just more active lifestyle, right? Uh, we have actually had a few, like we were offered in the Broncos training facility, the uh, Phoenix Coyotes, uh, or the Arizona oh, Coyotes, wow. rather. I had like, picked up the product. So um, we see a lot of benefit within the the sports realm again it's kind of those in-between moments of when you're performing yeah. it's just a good beverage but then when you look at like an everyday person who's active and active means a number of different things to a number of different people an entrepreneurial yeah. uh journey is is a different active lifestyle than a, a new parent right as a new parent right. you, you the active it's just different <laughs> And so for me, I went from athlete to entrepreneur yeah. to now family man. And it's like, man, you have to be able to cater to these different active lifestyles. So I'm not going to confuse uh, a new parent with a professional athlete or anything like that, but it's <laughs> active is right. different to everyone. And so for us, it's like, we've had a ton of people that just live this active, more natural lifestyle where our product has a ton of benefit to them. It could be the lower calorie and sugar content, could be the variable amounts of caffeine, it could be the benefits from the different raw organic ingredients that we use. That's the fun yeah. part for us is that we're not trying to pigeonhole ourselves to be a performance beverage. It's really about creating a product that has relevance throughout your lifestyle, regardless of your lifestyle uh, and how it can contribute to a more kind of more positive recreational uh and fun loving yeah uh, so the, kind of this is a lifestyle drink this is a lifestyle drink then yeah yeah it, it is and i think that i always kind of cringe at that because there's so many brands that say they're a lifestyle beverage We're brand style yeah <laughs> yeah and so that that to me is a very uh general term and, and when you look at beverages in general i'll speak to that is 
they say they're a lifestyle beverage brand, but they don't really like pinpoint the lifestyle or the yep. packaging, like the deliverable doesn't necessarily translate to that lifestyle. Right. So it's like, mm-hmm you're in a glass container and you're like, we're for the hikers. People aren't taking glass hiking, you know? (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. So you're, are you really a a product for an active, like hiking lifestyle that the packaging doesn't necessarily line up with um, what you're delivering. And so that that's a big part for us is that we have to make sure that it's in a convenient package. We can be poolside. We can be on the go uh, that nature. So. For anybody wondering as well, the tea I'm drinking has 10 calories, 2 grams of sugar, and 45 milligrams of caffeine. That's pretty good. Yeah, we have anything from zero caffeine in our strawberry um, up to 130 milligrams in our uh, pineapple mate and our honey lemon black tea there. Wow, that's nice. That's nice. Um, All right, pivoting a little bit. Sorry, I just got so caught up in in the story. It's such a fantastic story. And uh, this will go back into the story a little bit, but what role did mentors play along your journey? Yeah, um, mentors come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, ages, (laughs) and things of that nature. Um, Yep. I actually really tap into like my friends, to be honest with you. I think if you can draw inspiration from your close-knit friends, that you can really gain a lot because you can actually share a lot with that person, you have a a personal connection to those individuals, um, but then you also know kind of what they're going through. And so from a mentor perspective, um, it's been huge to tap into my own personal network. Um, And I was trying to surround myself with just interesting and fascinating people that are just trying to, trying to make headway with whatever uh, venture they're pursuing. Um, But then looking outside of that, right? Like you want to look at people who have been there and done that. And uh, we've been fortunate to surround ourselves with, um, some investors and advisors that have created really fascinating paths within their personal and professional careers. And so for me, it's surrounding myself with those people that I can actually talk to about experiences. Um, and it's not all just yeah. professional either. I mean, that's important. There needs to be a personal connection in that. And that's right. actually where you can really dig in deep uh, and, and get more out of that connection and that relationship. So for me, uh, they've played uh, really a great role in being able to dissect situations, analyze um, certain you know uh, decisions that I have to make within the business and looking through it yeah. uh, clearly. At the end of the day, it's, it's my decision, but if they can provide an interesting perspective, uh, that helps me make a case one way or another. And so mentorship is... Uh, I'm leaning more and more into that as I get older. Um, yeah. And I really wish that I had done it a little bit earlier, but it's uh, <laughs> it certainly plays a huge part in, uh, in evolving as not only a, an individual, but also as an entrepreneur within the company. Right. And well, and now we're going to turn the table a little bit and you'll be the mentor to some people watching the show. You know, we have a lot of people watching the show who are high school students, college students, uh, you know, people who want to switch careers. And a lot of people are looking at marketing. A lot of people are looking at entrepreneurship, especially since COVID uh, is winding down. There's huge populations of people who are sitting at home going, well, now that I've had to think about this, what the hell am I doing? (laughs) Essentially, I should go do my own thing. Um, What advice would you have for any future marketer or entrepreneur that wants to get started, but maybe just doesn't know where to start? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, sometimes I wish I would listen to my own advice sometimes (laughs) Uh, in the grand scheme of things. I do think from a marketing perspective, I'll say going into that career down that path, I think the word marketing needs to evolve or it is evolving and and this is where i think this is the challenge but also the opportunity for marketers is that for the longest time there was a little bit of disconnect between marketing and sales within companies and it's big or small right it's they develop really cool marketing strategies ad campaigns things like that and then there's a sales division that just goes out and pushes the product and i can only speak to really the consumer product space so take that with a grain of salt and so what i think needs to happen and it's something that we're really focusing on is remove the word marketing and focus on the word growth 
And mm. the word growth you can put into the equation because when you're in the marketing position, you have to be able to translate the messaging of the brand, the communication to the audience and correlate it to sales. There has to be a return on that investment. Yep. And you have to be able to connect dots in regards to the efforts that you're putting forth from a marketing perspective that is positively contributing to sales. If you can't do that, there's only so much benefit you can add to the company. And I think that that's where traditional old school like ad agency stuff um, can absolutely produce unbelievable content. Um, but how do you translate that to actually you know, performance KPIs for the sales teams and things of that nature. Um, that's just been a challenge for a lot of brands. And I think the ones that make that connection of translating marketing into growth, uh, those are the ones that you see really take off. And those are some of the brands that we're honestly trying to catch. And um, I just think that that's the perspective and the lens that I would look through if I'm in the marketing space right now. You can be creative but how does being creative translate to growth? That's really the, the connection yeah. point that needs to occur. And I think would, if you can do that, you add infinite value uh, to your stock within any company. Um, and a unique trait that just, you have to dig deep uh, and you have to try and establish KPIs for some of your marketing initiatives and efforts and things of that nature that translate into performance. And so, would be a, a big piece of advice um that i would have for anyone going down this path and then you know lesson or, or uh, advice rather for someone getting in the entrepreneurial space um I, I i harp on this a lot uh, i think that the personal pace that's required um for entrepreneurism is something that needs to be discussed more right like it's confidence levels in yourself, things of that nature. Um, and what I mean by that is the outside world makes it seem like if you just follow your passion and create a product, you're going to work for yourself for the rest of your life and be a millionaire. Um, that's <laughs> You only hear about the successes. You don't really hear about the failures. And, uh, and I say failures, but like the companies that don't hit that like – extreme hockey stick um and it's challenging man like it, it 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 causes you to have a lot of challenging conversations either with your team uh with investors uh challenging conversations with yourself your ability to lead things of that nature um yeah. it's, it's just really important to tap into your personal well-being and your personal headspace to make sure that um you're operating clearly that you're communicating some of the challenges that you're having you're getting honest feedback um, that's definitely something that I'm trying to work on better um, because it's a it's a long journey, man. It is not a start something and sell it in three years and on to the next thing. Um, yep. It's going to test your uh, your confidence uh, and just your ability uh, to show up every single day and perform. And so, those are little bits of advice that I would that I would offer. It's not always the rah rah stuff, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> no, no, I me, it's really let me tell you. I call that um, the Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg syndrome when somebody thinks, okay, I'm going to start my thing. I'm going to be a millionaire with all this crazy stuff uh, because, yeah, we, we see the end of the story for so many successful entrepreneurs. We see when they've, when they've already climbed the mountain, but we haven't seen the journey up the mountain and all the crazy stuff that happened to them. Uh, and a lot of people you know, pull from stories like, Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg or Apple and um, Mark Zuckerberg was much more of like the hockey like which the hockey stick but Steve Jobs really struggled for years with with his yeah. team and and people just you know that's not in the movies really it's at the end when he's finally got the iPod coming out and the and the Apple computers coming out and people are like oh that's super great and so that's something that I tell people a lot as well and they say well what should I do uh, with entrepreneurship? And I'm like, well, d don't watch the documentaries and the movies on Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and all these people where they're already successful in the documentary. You've, you've got to dig a lot. Um, and I think that something that's come up in our conversation a lot is confidence and patience sort of at the same time. Thinking, I'm going yeah. to get there if I keep doing this, but I have to be patient in the process. 
Um, and yeah. that's a lot of people rush their businesses. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I 100% agree with you, right? Like, they only make movies about the success stories. Uh, cause, and I get it. I read, I read the books that are, I, I know what the <laughs> yeah. end result is. I get motivated and pumped, but I'm also kind of like, for every Mark Zuckerberg, there are 50, at least 1,000, 10,000 people yeah. who try to create a social media platform, leverage everything, and it didn't work. And there's a lot to learn from those people, you know, and, and they have some very, uh, you know, entrepreneurial, like little tidbits you can pull from that and some inspirational stuff. But at the end of the day, it didn't work out. And so they don't write stories about that. But I think that those are <laughs> yeah. just as important um, and, and to be aware oh, of sure. than just the, the messes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So what other advice or anything do you have to tell the audience? That was our last scripted question but if there's anything else you'd like to tell our audience before we start to wrap up the show now's your chance <laughs> sounds ominous yeah um <laughs> obviously from like a you know a, a marketing perspective right that's the, the focus of this show um i think that um going out into the marketing realm within your business right i think it really is important to tap into truly the roots of the story, right? Um, don't try and get caught up. I kind of alluded to this earlier, so it may be a little bit redundant, but I feel like the more you can stay true to yourself and to the identity of your brand and, and just have confidence that it's going to kind of withstand some of the, you know, uh, trends within the marketplace. Like for us, you know, product development, right? That's, I look at, there's, there's an element of marketing within product development because you have to look at, creating something that's going to, you know, be able to be marketed. Um, right. We want to make sure that we create something and have confidence and do all the research that's like, you know what? Yeah, there's a trend for maybe it's a different enhancements within the beverage, right? Like um, we kind of talked about, there's like mushroom teas and things of that nature. And some of these beverage trends come and they stay and some of them come and they go. And, you know, you got, you know, uh, very, um, you know, pulled to the side to, to do CBD tea one time and all these other things that kind of come yep. about and you kind of have to cut the noise and stick to the script and just say, no, no, our waypoint is, is this in the future. We need to stay steadfast with that approach. We need to trust that we put in the work to identify that as the opportunity. And there's going to be little blips in the radar here and there, but we have confidence in the fact that we, we know where we're going we know that there's opportunity yeah. there and we just gotta stay true because if we're just going to try and ride every single wave that comes around at the end of the day, we're just not going to have an identity. And I will say firsthand, I most certainly got caught up in that type of stuff. And so yeah. the more and more that we say no to certain things, the more and more clear our marketing message becomes, if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, instead of trying to For do sure. all the things that everyone wants you to do, stick to your, guns have confidence in it do the research um and also make sure that you have the audience uh that has interest in it um and stick to your guns so that to me is you know the my like, kind of last piece of advice would be um put in the work have confidence in yourself and trust that it's gonna work out wow again pete jokish here who is spilling all the tea and providing the tea that we spill as well <laughs> on Marketing Tip Tea Time. Let me tell you, everyone, you need to go check out uh, Pete and and his brand and his tea. So you can connect with Pete on uh, LinkedIn. And you can also go check out uh, Tico Tea Company online. You can contact them at orders at tico.com or at www.tico.com. And yes, they do have all the information, everything. If you if you don't want to go online to buy or, or learn, you can also just walk into your local grocery store and buy some of these. I would strongly recommend trying them. This was a delight. This was absolutely a delight. We are so thankful that you came on the show today, Pete, in the midst of a snowstorm here in Colorado that is happening right now as we speak, <laughs> as we're filming this. And um, yep. yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you to everybody who supports us. Uh, thank you to Josh French, who is our 
technical producer upstairs. Thank you to Phil Van Drunen, who's our assistant technical producer. Thank you also to our graphics and music supervisor, Peter Romero, who created that stinger that you see at the beginning and the end of every show. We are so thankful for the work he's done. And also thank you to Sheridan and Alyssa Youngval, who are our graphic designers and our set designers, who put together this beautiful set uh, that you see the beautiful part of in the frame. There are wires everywhere. Uh, outside of the frame, but it is so fantastic to have so many great supporters and thank you Thank you. Thank you to our audience who has given us so many views uh, So much engagement and we look forward to serving you strategies tips and sips on marketing tip tea time in the future um, Really just you know, thank you to everybody who watches and if you haven't already, please go like share and subscribe We are always looking for more subscribers and more ways to engage our audience and if you think that you have a fantastic idea about somebody we should have on the show or you just want a certain topic talked about on the show please reach out to us you can find us on instagram TikTok, youtube linkedin you, you can find us on all the platforms or you can also go to www.marketingtipteatime.com and you can check out our podcast there and submit any inquiries for the show that you might have Everyone, thank you so much, uh, and until our next episode, until next time, Nasravi, cheers. Thank you so much, Pete. Cheers. <laughs>